Good afternoon. Let me first start by saying again that we pray for all of the victims of the Key Bridge collapse and also their loved ones. Since yesterday's briefing, we've continued to meet with families of all the victims. And they are on our hearts, and we are thinking about them now and always. Ellos están en nuestro corazón, están en nuestro pensamiento, hoy y siempre. Also, to all people who have offered prayers, I ask this, keep offering them. The families, the first responders, they will continue to need them. Our state will continue to need them. Today, we're at the Maryland Transportation Authority's police headquarters. This is where our first responders and emergency personnel gathered the day of the collapse. We set up mission control immediately and got to work right here. And we are so grateful to the extraordinary work of our MDTA police. And we're thinking of all of our first responders, including the extraordinary men and women of our National Guard. This place holds a special significance for us. This place, in this moment, because in the time of that collapse, our work, and since the time of the collapse, our work has only accelerated. And we have a series of 24-7 operations currently underway. Unified Command are conducting planning and engineering assessments 24 hours a day. We have assets on the water enforcing safety zones 24 hours a day. We have assessments on the dolly being conducted 24 hours a day. This is an around the clock operation. And we're going to ramp up our 24 seven posture in the coming days. I wanna give special thanks to Admiral Gilreath and the Coast Guard who have been working tirelessly. The Commandant of the Coast Guard was here just yesterday and I had a chance to thank Admiral Fagan for her team's work and we're grateful. We're grateful for them now and always. Now today, I'll provide updates on the four directives that I've issued to this team. And as a reminder, first, we need to continue to focus on recovery. Second, we need to clear the channel and open vessel traffic to the port. Third, we need to take care of all of the people who have been affected by this crisis. And fourth, we need to, and we will, rebuild the key bridge. This morning, I received a briefing from Unified Command, and I've spoken with leaders all across the state, and also leaders from our fellow delegation, leaders from all across the country, and been working on, who have been working on this response throughout. So first, on our recovery efforts. As I mentioned yesterday, we need to do more work on clearing the channel in order to move forward. This is a remarkably complex operation, and our focus needs to be on unity of command and unity of effort. Conditions in the water make it unsafe for rescue divers. And we're not just talking about weather and wind. We're talking about debris. We're talking about wreckage. We're talking about pieces of the key bridge that are in the water. One of the mantras in the military that we learned was this, mission first, people always. And that's the mindset that we are applying to this work. We are going to move as fast as possible. We are going to ensure the safety of our first responders, and we are not going to compromise one for the other. We are going to do both at the same time. Right now, the conditions make it unsafe for rescue divers. But as soon as those conditions change, Colonel Butler has assured me that those rescue divers will be going right back in the water. I also want to remind everyone that this is a no drone zone. It has been established and that is throughout the entire airspace surrounding the collapse. This is not a game and please do not test my seriousness on this. The instructions are simple 
and they must be followed. All drones are to stay away from the site of the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse, period, and full stop. Now, second, on clearing the federal channel and opening vessel traffic to the port, with a salvage operation that is this complex and this unprecedented, you need to be able to plan for every single moment. And this work is going to take time, and we are going to continually assess and reassess this situation. This morning, Unified Command assured me that the hull of the Dolly is damaged but intact. The Army Corps and their partners will begin to move forward with the crane operations today. The north sections of the key bridge are going to be cut up and removed. This will eventually allow us to open up a temporary restricted channel that will help us to get more vessels in the water around the site of the collapse. And our friends at Trade Point Atlantic have agreed to help us with the process wreckage from the salvage and operation. And to the team at Trade Point, I want to say thank you again for stepping up. This is going to take time to clear this section of the collapse. It's not going to take hours. It's not going to take days. But once we complete this phase of the work, we can move more tugs and more barges and more boats into the area to accelerate our recovery. As of yesterday, 377 people were actively engaged in response operations in support of Unified Command. And we will continue to marshal people and resources to ensure that we have everything that we need to do this work as safely, as efficiently, and as effectively as possible. Now, I've said this before, I will say it again, and I will continue to say this. This is not just about Maryland. This is about our nation's economy. The port handles more cars and more farm equipment more than any other port inside this country. And at least 8,000 workers on the docks have jobs that have been directly affected by this collapse. Our economy depends on the Port of Baltimore and the Port of Baltimore depends on vessel traffic. Maryland's economy and Maryland workers rely on us to move quickly, and it's not just Maryland that is being impacted. I'm also talking about the farmer in Kentucky. I'm also talking about the auto worker in Ohio. I'm talking about the restaurant owner in Tennessee. This is impacting all of us. And the nation's economy and the nation's workers are relying on us to move quickly and to move together. Third, taking care of our people. I've said it already, mission first, people always. Last night, the Small Business Administration accepted our request to approve a disaster declaration. And that declaration is now in effect. I want to thank the Biden-Harris administration for accepting our request within a matter of hours. And I want to personally thank President Biden for his constant support. Because of this declaration, small businesses affected by the disaster can now apply for disaster loan assistance from the federal government, and these are low interest loans up to $2 million. They're going to help us ensure that our small businesses get the cash that they need to pay their bills and to keep people employed. The applications should be submitted online at lending.sba.gov by December 30th, 2024. I'm going to say it one more time so people can, so, uh, so for those who missed it can hear it again. Applications should be submitted online at lending.sba.gov and they should be in by December 30th of 2024. This declaration also empowers the state of Maryland to apply for new federal funding to pay for services and training for impacted workers and wage recovery. I've been briefed by the Maryland Department of Labor. They've assured me that they are working around the clock to get that application submitted ASAP. The Small Business Administration will also be establishing a business resource center on Monday. We will get that location information to you as soon as we know more. Now fourth, 
on rebuilding. I said it yesterday. We cannot rebuild the bridge until we have cleared the wreckage. But we are going to get this done. We will clear the wreckage. We will move the dolly. And we will rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge. We are going to do that because we are Maryland tough and we are Baltimore strong. And you can bet on that. So in this moment, I'm going to hand it off to Senator Chris Van Hollen. And also, in order, we're also joined by and received briefings by leaders from the U.S. Coast Guard, the Maryland State Police, the Maryland Department of Transportation. We're also here with Baltimore City Mayor Brandon Scott, Anne Arundel County Executive Stuart Pittman, and other leaders. And now, I'm honored to turn it over to Senator Chris Van Hollen. Thank you, Governor. And I want to thank you, uh, Mayor Brandon Scott, uh, County Executive Pittman, County Executive Oshevsky, for first and foremost doing everything you can to support the families of the six individuals, the six souls that we lost. I know all the efforts you're undertaking to make sure they know that the community in our state stands with them. So thank you. I also want to say to our first responders, thank you not for just what you did at the moment of the crisis, but what you continue uh, to do and to the divers who are going to be looking at the wreckage so we can figure out the best plan uh, forward. As the governor has said, our priority is to make sure that all those thousands of Marylanders and others whose livelihood depends on the port of Baltimore get back to work as soon as possible. And that means, number one, making sure we have the channel open, but in the meantime, doing everything we can to support them and their families. And again, I want to thank you, Governor, and the General Assembly for the fast work that you've undertaken uh, through emergency legislation to address that. I spoke this morning uh, to Acting Labor Secretary Julie Su. She is also, as you know, working with the Maryland team uh, to do everything possible at the federal level to support uh, those workers and those jobs as we work to get the channel open and the port open. Small businesses, uh, the governor mentioned the good news from today. Uh, the SBA administrator, uh, Guzman, uh, very quickly reviewed the state's request. Uh, and those are emergency low interest loans that will go to support small businesses, 4% uh, over 30 years. Uh, and a grace period during the first year so small businesses can do everything they can to keep their workers on the job as we work to open the channel. Opening the channel, as you heard from the governor, that is the number one priority. And I want to thank uh, President Biden and his entire team for being laser focused on helping Baltimore and Maryland in the aftermath of this emergency. We've heard from the Coast Guard and we're going to hear from them again. I want to thank them. Uh, Admiral, it was great to join you and the, the Commandant of the Coast Guard yesterday to see a close-up view of the site, uh, the bridge, the ship, and everything that we need to do uh, to address it. It gave us a close-up sense of the magnitude of the challenge, uh, but we also know that we are up to meeting that challenge and doing it as fast as possible. And to the Army Corps of Engineer and the Navy and the others who are being deployed to do this job, I want to thank you. And again, thank you to the Biden-Harris administration because the federal government will cover the total costs of clearing the channel so that we can get those ships moving again and get the port open. On rebuilding the bridge, again, Governor, thank you and your team for such fast work. And thank you to President Biden and his team for such fast action. $60 million is already being made available on a quick uh, basis uh, to make sure that we can address the impact on surrounding traffic patterns uh, from the fact that the bridge uh, has collapsed. And then Maryland has also been deemed eligible. They've been accepted into the emergency uh, program uh, at the federal level. Uh, that will mean that the federal government will pick up 90% of the costs of that program. 
And Senator Cardin and I will be working very hard with our delegation, Congressman Nfume and others, to make sure that we make good on President Biden's promise that the federal government will pick up the full cost. And I just also want to say uh, Ben Cardin could not be here at this moment. He's been here day in, day out. He will be back. Uh, we work very closely together with the governor's team on those small business uh, loans. And we're going to be working together to introduce uh, that legislation on behalf of our delegation. This is an, a great American city. This is a great American port. And I really hope that our colleagues in the Senate and House will come together as Americans to address this crisis as we came together as Americans when we saw previous bridge collapses, for example, in Minneapolis in 2007. Uh, this is really a moment for us all to unite. I want to thank again the governor, his team, and everybody here who are part of uh, the executive branch at the federal level and the state level and the local level. Uh, we are going to get this done, uh, and we will also make sure that as the NTSB does its work, that if there are funds that will flow because of any liability by any party that contributed to what happened here, if there's liability, those funds will be returned to the federal government to offset any outlays the federal government undertakes in this effort. So we are here again to get this job done, open the port as fast as possible, begin the process of rebuilding the bridge, and you've got the A team here from the federal government, the state government, the city government, county governments to get it done under the quarterbacking of Governor Moore. So thank you, Governor, and uh, we'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Rear Admiral Shannon Gilreath. Governor, Senator, I'd like to thank you for your kind words about this response so far. And I want to emphasize that this is a team effort. It's not just the Coast Guard. We are part of this community. We are heavily invested in this. But it is a team effort made up a number of federal partners, including the United States Navy, Supervisor of Salvage, the Army Corps of Engineers, and other federal agencies and partners. And there are a tremendous number of state and local officials and agencies that are helping us. And you see some of them to my left. They are a huge part of this unified command in making this go and work. And I also want to thank the community at large for your amazing support that you've given us. We feel the love that's coming from this community and this city and this state. So thank you so much for that. And please continue your prayers for the families of the people that were impacted by this. I want to give you a very brief update on some of the things that are happening in the Unified Command. Our number one priority remains reopening the Port of Baltimore. And to do that, we've got to clear that deep draft channel. And so I've talked about our phases. We're going to continue with that reopening the deep draft channel and remove that debris. We're going to then remove the ship, and then we're going to also continue to remove debris from the bridge across the waterway. Now, those efforts are ongoing. We're continuing to bring in the resources for that. We are continuing to do diving just for the purposes of evaluating how we can actually potentially cut up portions of the bridge, how we can rig for future lifts with the cranes, and how we can figure out exactly how to do this as safely as possible so that we can get that channel reopened. And we're working really, really hard on that to get that done with the smartest engineers we have, and they are really working hard on that. And so I've got, I'm fortunate to say that we don't have to do all of those in the exact same order. It doesn't have to go linearly. It can go simultaneously. And we are working really hard in that regard. And so I'm really proud to announce that the governor said we're going to conduct our first lift today on a piece of a portion of the bridge just north of that uh, deep draft shipping channel. And we're, we will continue planning efforts for once we get that cleared to open that up for tug and barge traffic to come into the Port of Baltimore. But that's going to take some more time. And this is a step in that process. Much like when you run a marathon, you've got to take the first few steps, where we're taking those few, first few steps and we're continuing to get the resources in that will propel us to the finish line. But we're working to get there as fast as we can. We're gonna open it as soon as possible and we're gonna to continue to do it safely. 
and I'd like that later today you'll hear from the Maryland Department of Transportation about that particular lift because they're really using their expertise in engineering and their contractors and engineers to help us with that. So I'd like for them to speak more about that. But Governor, thank you very much for your continued support of this unified command. It truly is a partnership and it's a privilege to get to work here. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Colonel Butler of the Maryland State Police. The Maryland State Police continue to be an active part of the unified command. As Governor Moore mentioned, the brave members of our underwater rescue teams remain on standby. They will resume their recovery efforts once the Unified Command has informed them it is safe to resume diving operations. Again, as Governor Moore stressed just moments ago, we are reminding the public that the Federal Aviation Administration has implemented a temporary flight restriction following the bridge collapse. This restriction extends for three miles from the center of the bridge in radius and 1,500 feet from ground level up. I want to emphasize the importance of refraining from flying drones in the area. Doing so poses significant risk to the ongoing efforts by all of our partners to respond to this incident and bring it to closure. I urge everyone to exercise responsibility and respect the airspace restrictions around the Francis Scott, B, Francis Scott Key bridge collapse site. Please refrain from operating drones in the facility and the vicinity, allow emergency personnel to carry out their duties safely and effectively. Law enforcement is actively monitoring the area for illegal drone use. Law enforcement has already responded to multiple drone incursions over the past few days. There's a zero tolerance policy regarding any drone anywhere within the no drone zone established by the FAA. Anyone who attempts to fly a drone and any prohibited monitor in the area is subject to arrests, prosecution, and or fines. In addition, we know that this tragedy has far-reaching uh, implications that will affect the daily lives of Marylanders for the foreseeable future. I want to assure the public that the Maryland State Police, the Maryland Transportation Authority Police, and all of our law enforcement partners are working together with the Maryland Department of Transportation to mitigate the impact of this incident on traffic safety. As always, our troopers are actively monitoring road conditions, directing traffic, and enforcing safety regulations to prevent crashes and minimize delays. We're asking all motorists, now more than ever, exercise both caution and patience as we navigate through this challenging period. Please adhere to the posted speed limits, avoid distractions while driving, and never drive impaired. Also, please continue to remember the move over law for first responders, tow truck operators, work crews, and any motorists who may have become disabled on the side of the road. We understand that this situation may cause inconvenience. However, your safety is our top priority. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Paul Wiedefeld, Secretary of Transportation. <clears throat> Emphasizing the governor's leadership and directions, uh, the Maryland Department of Transportation continues to support the unified command salvage efforts. As has been said many times, we'll have said many more times, the top priority is clearing the shipping channel. Crews are out today working to remove part of the north side of the bridge that remains. The first piece could be removed and dropped off to Trade Point Atlantic as soon as today. And as the um, Admiral said, that is done by some of the forces that we brought on board, but the reality is it's done by Unified Command. That's who's doing that work. And as also was said, this is the first of many, many, many steps going forward, but it is a huge milestone as we start this process. I also want to, uh, although we've lost obviously a tremendous amount of activity at the Port of Baltimore, there still is some activity going on at the Port of Baltimore, particularly at Trade Point Atlantic. Trade Port Atlantic continues to move auto vehicles and put them into their processing center. We're also working with Trade Point Atlantic to offload auto vehicles at their Sparrows Point facility and move them to processing areas where workers can get, read, get them ready for dealerships. This is all about bringing people back to work. I also wanted to stress that the port's distribution operations continue, including cargo that, is com that comes in by truck and rail and we will continue to explore other opportunities, again, to bring labor back to the Port of Baltimore. 
Turning to traffic, our highway system, we continue to monitor the traffic conditions and any changes that are impacting the system as a whole. As I previously mentioned, we are seeing increased traffic throughout Fort McHenry and the Baltimore Harbor tunnels. That being said, so far, we have not seen any significant additional delays. We do have a special team focused just on traffic issues, as was mentioned by the superintendent. And yesterday, our team held a working session with Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Anne Arundel County to deal with specific issues, uh, immediate specific issues, but also think long term about some of the issues we may be facing. We also are working with our part partners at the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. And we're doing that because they have traffic data and modeling capabilities, again, will help us plan movement throughout the region. Rebuilding the bridge. Our efforts to rebuild the Francis Scott, Scott Key Bridge, we're working closely with our federal, particular federal highway administration partners. The $60 million that we did receive from them are being used today as we start to remove some of the structure there, and they'll continue to help us with some of the traffic mitigations. We're also working with them at the same time to think through how do we fund, how do we design, how do we deliver the, the, the new Francis Scott Key Bridge. In closing, as many gather for the holiday weekend, my thoughts, our thoughts, the department's thoughts continue to be with the families of the contractors we lost. I appreciate the quick action of the first responders, including the Maryland Transportation Authority's police officers who were first on the scene. Their action saves lives. This holiday weekend, I urge everyone to be safe on the roads, slow down, put the phone away, and allow for extra time to reach your destination. Your family is counting on you to, re re to return safely. Thank you, and Mayor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and good afternoon. I'll begin uh, the way I've begun every one of these this week with prayers for those who we've lost in this tragedy and with those who are bracing for the impacts that our city and our state will confront over the coming weeks and months. As thousands upon thousands of Baltimoreans gather uh, this Easter weekend, I know uh, that this tragedy, these families, and the journey to recovery that our city, our state, and our country are, are, are on together will be in everyone's hearts and minds. I want to extend uh, my continued thanks to those at the Unified Command, uh, the Coast Guard, State Police, all local and state agencies, and now uh, civilian savage operators who continue to work around the clock, as you've heard today. Our coordination at every level of government has been second to none. And Admiral, I want to say thank you for leading us in that effort. And with this massive of an operation, that is notable itself. Members of my team, including senior staff and the Mayor's Office of Emergency Management, are embedded. And the daily briefings and coordination is a testament to how we will get this done. As you heard, uh, crews will begin to remove records today, but we must be reminded again that this is going to be a long process. Uh, many of you know that I'm a runner, and I'll say it like this. Uh, the winner of the marathon or the 5K is never the person who starts out the fastest. In fact, in my experience, those people end up last or not finishing the race at all. The winner always has the right pace and finishes with a strong kick. That will be all of us when we celebrate the reopening of the channel and the reopening of the bridge in the future. We will all be exhausted but it will be worth it because we will have achieved our goals the right way and together. Doing it that way is going to make the process smoother and faster in the long run, and that's our ultimate goal. We're engaging with our state and federal partners, offering resources and bringing together business and labor communities as we look uh, towards the long-term impacts this will have. And as the salvage operation continues, we are never going to lose sight of the human aspect of this crisis. Myself and my team will remain focused on ensuring no one forgets one of our critical priorities has to and will continue to be bringing home the remaining missing workers so we can bring closure to their families. I know everyone shares that priority and together we will continue to wrap our arm around these families and our community who is still reeling. I remain grateful for every single person who has put out an ounce of energy to this response from the first responders to those represented here to those who are working 24 7 on this issue thank you uh, it means everything to us to those families to our city and to our state 
the outpouring of love and support has been breathtaking and showcases the best that we have to offer. And you're showing of the world what Baltimore means to you. Thank you. And now I turn it over to my partner, County Executive Pittman. Well, I want to start out by thanking all of the agencies and the folks who have been coordinating this effort. On the, the night of the disaster, of course, our first responders were here, our fireboats, our police. Uh, but since then, um, it has been the team led by Governor Moore. And I've been uh, really watching and listening um, at these daily briefings. And this governor is asking all the right questions, um, knows how to listen, and allowing folks to do their jobs. And I know that there's always there's always uh, the possibility of friction when so many levels of government are working together. But we have a president who understands the value of infrastructure and understands the value of career public servants. And thank you all for your public service. Um, I want to say something about Anne Arundel County <clears throat> and people and businesses. So if you look across the river, everything south of the bridge is Anne Arundel County um, all the way down to the Patuxent River. And that's 530 miles of coast and 600,000 people. And we have neighborhoods that were built in the northern part of our county, the highest density population, that were built because there were jobs at the Port of Baltimore. There were jobs at the steel mill. And we still have folks working at the Port of Baltimore and at Trade Point Atlantic. And it is so important and it gratifies me so much to know that we now have SBA loans for our businesses that benefit from the Port of Baltimore and for the workers. And for the workers, I want to specifically recognize one named Miguel Luna, who was on the bridge that night. Uh, por su familia, uh, nuestro corazón es con ustedes, la familia en El Salvador y también en Glen Burnie. Miguel is from Glen Burnie, and he is one of thousands of Salvadorans who make our economy strong in Anne Arundel County. And I meet with the bond rating agencies every year, and I talk to them about what makes our economy so strong. Why do we have three AAA bond ratings? And it is because of immigration and immigrants who do the hard work in our county. And it is also because of the Port of Baltimore. So we have warehouse businesses, we have manufacturing that are taking place in the northern part of our county because of this port. And all of us are watching, all of us are gratified by the coordinated response all of us are thrilled that there will actually be some wreckage that will start to be pulled out in the next 24, 48 hours, I think I heard, um, and look forward to that channel being open. Um, it is the gateway between our county and the city of Baltimore. And I wanna say to Mayor Scott that we have your pride of Baltimore, your tall ship in Annapolis right now, and it cannot get home we want it to get home, but I'll tell you that it can stay as long as it wants. Um, we will be visiting it and we will be remembering the city of Baltimore with pride and uh, pass it back to the governor. That, that's correct. So what is going to happen today is not going to be the piece that's uh, that's on the boat uh, that's that is on the uh, the, the dolly currently. Uh, and in the answer of when is that piece going to be uh, going to be lifted? Uh, we just do not have enough information. Uh, I, I cannot stress enough how important today and the first movement movement of this bridge and of the wreckage is. Um, it is it's it's a. Uh, this is this is going to be a, a remarkably complicated process that's even going to take place to this to this day. And even after that initial lift takes place, there needs, still needs to be an understanding of what forms of adjustments 
uh, have happened. How has lifting that one piece since begin the removal process, how does that impact the remainder of the bridge that still sits inside of the bay? And so we, we still do not yet have a timeline as to when we can actually begin lifting pieces off of off of the uh, off of the dolly but we know that today is a is a is a remarkably important moment but one that still is going to take further evaluation as to what type of impact that's going to have on the remainder of the mission uh, the the piece of the northern part of the bridge that's being that's going to be lifted today i believe has been cut i just i'm not physically on scene at the moment so i can't tell you where they are in the stage of the actual lifting but it is scheduled to be lifted today as the governor said thank you Well, let me start with uh, your your question about people from both sides of the aisle in Congress coming together uh, to address uh, this emergency. Uh, I have heard from um, my colleagues, uh, Republican colleagues in the Senate. Uh, I know that uh, Congressman Infume has heard from Republican colleagues in the House. Uh, now we're going to just have to come together and get this job done uh, on behalf of the country, as the governor has stressed. Uh, the Port of Baltimore impacts the entire country, and as we've all stressed, the entire purpose of the Emergency Relief Fund is to make sure that the federal government uh, picks up uh, the lion's share uh, when it, you have these kind of emergencies. And as the President has said, and as we did as a country back in 2007, uh, when the bridge in Minneapolis collapsed, people came together very quickly on a bipartisan basis. Uh, to make sure that we acted as Americans uh, to help a great city then, and we need to come together as Americans to help the great city of Baltimore now. And yes, it's true. Uh, we have reports of some debris in Anne Arundel County washing ashore, and um, um, I was just asking the Admiral, um, who is best to contact about that? People want to want to report it so that if there's um, research that needs to be done with some of that. Um. So we are we are working to set up a hotline and we'll put that out at some point, hopefully today, so that people will have a reporting number that they can call to let us know that they found debris and where, and then we'll work to figure out what to do next with that piece of debris. Suzanne Dorsey, Maryland Department of the Environment. Our inspectors have been on site at Riviera Beach and are investigating currently. Thank you, sir. Thanks. We've got a very long road ahead of us. Uh, I, I, I know that there are still more unknowns than knowns. And so the thing, that we, uh, the thing that we know is that we are going to get this done. We are going to get it complete. We are going to get the Port of Baltimore reopened. We are going to get the Francis Scott Key Bridge uh, reopened. But we also know that we're going to need people to be able to work together and to be patient. This is, uh, this is one of the more complex complex operations that, that we have seen. You know, there, there have been lessons learned that can be taken from things like Tampa and, 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 and Minnesota. Uh, when you're looking at a situation that you have a you have a, a, a vessel that is close to the size of the Eiffel Tower, that is sitting in the middle of the water with a key bridge where we're talking you know three four thousand tons of weight sitting on top of the barge, with electrical wires up top, with debris all in the water, um, the complexity of this cannot be overstated, and so we are we are going to move safely. We are going to move swiftly. We are going to get this done, but this is going to be a long road. Do you want to? 
I don't have the exact dimensions of that piece. It's going to be a top section of the bridge that they could get to, and they're going to cut it into a, a size that they can manage with the crane that they have to lift it. The crane, I believe, is a 160-ton lift crane, and so uh, that's a still a significant weight to do that. Um, I think that's a, I think that's what I'm. It's going to take the day to do it. I mean, they had to do the engineering process to plan to how that we could make those cuts. They're making those cuts. Then they're going to have to put straps to rig it, and then they will rig it, and they will set it on a barge so it can be brought back here. I don't have the timeline on when it's going to be complete. I just know that they were going to do the lift today and we're going to do it safely. And so every time you do this, you occasionally encounter challenges and you got to work around those when you do. And so we're going to do it safely because we don't want to injure any of those workers that are doing that work. That's the intent. As, as quickly as safely possible. Uh, the thing that we know is that even after the initial adjustments are done, we still have to make sure that, uh, that, that that movement does not cause any further complications or any further challenges. Uh, and so we know that by having the ability to open up that secondary channel, it will allow some, you know, some additional smaller barges and boats and, and tugs, et cetera, to be able to come into that area. But even in the area that we're looking at where those adjustments are being made, it's still not to the same depth level of what we're looking at where the main where the main challenge is. And so it will allow some additional access, not complete access of, of, uh, of what we need to do in order to clear the channel. But, uh, but we do know that even with that, uh, it's still gonna take a little bit of time to first ensure that these initial pull uh, that we're taking of the, of the, of the wreckage, uh, that it does not have any, any secondary consequences. Correct, that, that's still something that's coming further down the line. Oh, so it, 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 once we are able to get a channel reopened, it can potentially be re reused for commercial assets also. Yeah. But we've got to get it cleared first, and that's what we're working on. And, and we are doing this simultaneously as we continue to plan to reopen the deep draft channel right. also. If this is available first, then we would do that first as we continue to work on the other. But it's not a delay to the deep draft channel at all. Is simply working in parallel with the resources to maximize our efficiency to get this done as soon as possible and do it safely. It, it's not the thousand ton crane going to be doing that lift. It's a different. Uh, crane that we have to do it and I'm not sure whether it was divers that are doing that one or that one was enough out of the water that they could do it uh, without having to dive on it to do those cuts and lift. We're, we're going to use the larger crane at some point. We just needed it to get here and so it's here and so when we can get the engineering done and the assessments done and figure out how to cut up that large section that you see on top of the dolly then that's when I think we'll be using that larger crane. But we're not going to waste any time with the assets we have available to us because, again, we're doing this as quickly as we possibly can and doing it safely. So as to the 
as to a potential auxiliary channel. It, it starts with, again, removing all of that debris and then ensuring exactly what depth of water we have to be able to say what are the draft restrictions on the vessels that can use it. But once we have got that cleared, we will simultaneously mark the channel with buoys so that mariners can see how to transit through there. And then we may have to put some restrictions on that because we don't want it to ever interfere with clearing that deep draft channel. That's our, that's our priority. But if we can open up another one that will help the economy here and move traffic in and out of the Port of Baltimore, even if it's not the deep draft, we want to take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and what we have today for the Business Recovery, uh, Business Recovery Center, this is really uh, allocating uh, the opportunity for, for loans up to $2 million for our small businesses. Uh, and you know, again, they can start the application process, uh, process now as, as, as the site is open and we'll have additional information that's also gonna be processed. But that's a way of being able to provide a measure of support for our small businesses, uh, the ones that are being hurt by what One, two. One, two. Thanks for the patience, guys. Have any any further updates than what was already already disclosed? Had a chance to speak with uh, speak about one survivor the, back the day of uh, the day of the incident, but don't have any additional updates. Okay, Last question you. here. Perfect, Danny from the Washington Post. Um, a couple questions. One, is there any chance that the um, repayments for these low interest loans can be waived or forgiven? Uh, uh, on, on the the loans that have uh, that have just been announced. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the terms have been laid out uh, for them, but uh, but you know, obviously, this is always something that uh, we're uh, we're continuing to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.